Hey, it's Dr. John Terry, the Black Belt Leader, and welcome to the Black Belt Leadership Podcast, where each week I'm giving you tips, tools, insights, and resources to help you become a better version of who you are and what you do as you discover, develop, and deploy your own Black Belt Leader within. Hey, this week, I want to talk about an issue that we all face, we all have to deal with, and oftentimes, this issue holds us back or limits our ability to achieve all the success we want in life. What am I talking about? I'm talking about bias, in particular, our bias toward bias. This week's episode, The Bias Bias. Let's jump right in and get started. You know, when I mention bias, it's something we all have. It's a belief. It's an opinion. It's a precondition. It's a prejudice. It's something that we hold on to, maybe without ever questioning why we hold on to it. If you look up the word bias in the dictionary, you're going to see a significant number of definitions, often referring to the very things I just shared, belief, opinion, precondition, or prejudice. But it also refers to bias as partiality, partisanship, favoritism, bigotry, intolerance, unfairness, or discrimination. Now, when you think about bias and its impact on our lives, here's what we know from scientific research. Bias shapes our thinking and it influences our beliefs. Bias can distort how we process and prioritize information, and it sways how we make decisions and the corresponding actions that we take based upon what we believe to be true and what we believe is the best course of action. Bias filters our view of the world, and it influences how we view and interact with other people. So where did bias come from, and how did we get the biases that we hold on so dearly to? Well, it's interesting that it comes in the early formative years of our lives. Our parents, our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, our siblings, our school teachers, our pastors, our rabbis, other individuals that were influencers in the early years of our lives taught us many, many things. They taught us how to sit, how to walk, how to talk, how to feed ourselves, how to dress ourselves. They taught us appropriate behaviors. But along the way, every one of these individuals imprinted in our young, impressionable minds what they believed, and we simply accepted that to be true. We accepted their opinions, their biases, their beliefs, their prejudices without question. Why? Because our brains lacked any frame of reference to evaluate whether or not what they were telling us is true or valid. Now, sometimes these opinions and beliefs and biases that are passed down from other people in the early formative years of our lives and even later in life, many of those are innocuous. You know, think about it. Aversions to certain foods. I don't like eggs. Don't ask me why, but I don't like eggs. It's a bias. It's something I just choose not to eat. Preferences towards a sports team. If you grew up in my house and you didn't like the Razorbacks, you were in trouble because my mom was a Razorback fan. Partiality towards certain models or makes of vehicles. Things like this are commonly passed on from parents to children. Your parents got it from their parents and so on and so forth. You know, and think about it. All of us as children, not wanting to disappoint our parents, what did we do? We accepted their preferred way of thinking as fact and as truth, whether or not it was true or not. I mean, think about it. How many families have said, we're a Ford family, or we're a Chevy family, we're a Toyota family, or a Mazda family, we're a BMW family, or a Lexus family? We've heard those statements. They're innocuous, they're opinions, they're biases, but they're true to the believer as long as they believe it to be true. You know, if you grew up in Arkansas, it was Wee Pig Suey. If you grew up in Alabama, it was Roll Tide. If you grew up in Texas, it was probably Hook 'em Horns. Again, It's an opinion. It's a bias. It's innocuous, but it's part of the culture that we grew up in. Maybe for you, it's we're a chicken and dumplings family, or maybe it's a we're a steak and potatoes family, or maybe we're a vegetarian family, or maybe we're a sushi and rice and fish family. Whatever it may be, again, cultural biases and things passed down generationally, a lot of those things innocuous. You know, as I was thinking about biases and things that are passed down, I was thinking about growing up in the Terry household. My mom lost her mother at the age of 10 to cancer. So mom became the mom to five brothers and two sisters. Her dad was a coal miner and he worked hard to provide for his family, but mom was left to be the mom of the family when she was 10 years old. 
So mom cooked the few things that she learned how to cook well, and those things followed her the rest of her lives. We didn't have a lot of variety in our house. We ate a lot of the same foods, but here's what I can tell you. Southern cooking was commonplace in our home. And my sister and I, we love to eat it because that's all we typically had available. You know, exotic foods or foods from other countries or things weren't really tested and tried out in the Terry household because growing up a coal miner's daughter, those were extravagances that a single dad providing for multiple children simply couldn't afford. So those were things because of a bias we did not get a chance to experience growing up. Now, dad was a classical movie fan, and out of that, I gained a, a love and appreciation for classical music. Is it right? Is it wrong? No, it's a bias. It's an opinion. It's a preference. And that we see a lot in the biases that we live in every day. Now, dad was also a big fan of Hogan's Heroes, The Andy Griffith Show, and Gomer Pyle USMC, typical shows like that. So guess what we watched at the house growing up when dad was home? Those became opinions and preferences that we learned to watch and enjoy because that's what we were fed a continual diet of. Now, when mom was watching TV, which wasn't often because she was often cooking and cleaning, but when she wasn't, mom was a Western fan, specifically Gunsmoke and Bonanza. She also loved Gilligan's Island, The Lucy Show, and Marcus Welby, MD. So the things that we were exposed to early on in our childhood oftentimes flavor and color the things that we appreciate and value as we get older. You know, thinking back along the same line of biases, my parents were very devout people of faith. My dad was a bivocational minister for most of my life growing up until recently now at the age of 88. Dad's not actively engaged in that anymore in terms of actively preaching. But the values and the principal beliefs that they shared, that they began to teach me from the time I was just an infant, those things shaped my view of the world along with the character and values that I embraced as a young age. Today, I still live those values and principal beliefs out in my own life, as does my sister, Tanya. And what have we done? We have taught those same values and characters and beliefs to our own children and to our grandchildren. So you can easily see how biases and opinions and preferences get passed down generationally. You know, and, and looking back, as I thought about this lesson for today, it's very easy to see how our parents' preferences influence the preferences that you and I enjoy today. You know, it's even more interesting for me to look at my children and to see how the preferences that I got from my mom and dad, that they got from their moms and dads, have been passed down generationally. The beliefs, the biases, the opinions that you and I, that we all embraced from the time we were young, have often become the very same beliefs, biases, and opinions that we pass on to our children and grandchildren, and they in turn pass on to theirs. Truth be told, we all have a bias towards bias. We all have strongly held beliefs, opinions, and preferences that we hold on to with conviction. Now, these biases, whether they're conscious or not, can also fuel prejudice and they can fuel conflict. They can create divides between different communities and between different groups of people. These same biases often rely on inaccurate, incomplete, or simply bad information. These biases that we share and that we pass on generationally can often prevent people from seeing situations from a different viewpoint other than the narrow view of the world that they themselves possess. As a result of that, our biases can limit our creativity, can limit our ability to solve problems, and can limit our ability to effectively communicate and collaborate with other people. Now, interestingly enough, when we act on these biased beliefs, this can lead to incorrect conclusions, it can lead to misunderstandings, and at times, it can lead to unjust actions. And we've seen examples of that throughout history. As I said, we all have a bias toward bias. You and I, we all have strongly held beliefs, opinions, and preferences, convictions that we hold on to, whether they are true or not. But here's the question. Do we ever question, challenge, or examine what we believe and why? Now, throughout history, most people haven't, 
But interestingly enough, as we gaze back through the portals of time, we see that some people have taken it upon themselves to challenge conventional wisdom, to challenge biases that have become cultural norms, and to make a difference and change things for the better in their society. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about people like William Wilberforce who challenged the morality and even the legality of the slave trade in England in the 1760s, and he led the charge to the abolition of slavery in that country. Benjamin Franklin and Alexander Hamilton here in the United States led that charge early after the formation of the United States as a country, and it led the northern states to reject slavery. Now, Abraham Lincoln picked up on that movement and championed that cause decades later, which culminated in the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. Mahatma Gandhi was opposed to the caste system in India, where heredity alone determined your status. Nelson Mandela spoke out against apartheid. He fostered re racial reconciliation after becoming South Africa's first black head of state that was elected in their first democratic election. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton and her husband, Anthony, led the charge for women's voting rights in the 19th century. There are other examples throughout history, but here you can see where individuals chose to question, to challenge, and to examine what we believe and why, both individually as a society, to determine are these beliefs serving us well? Are they grounded in truth? More importantly, are they grounded in the truth? Or, and are they harming other people in the process? Those are some important things we need to pay attention to as we're thinking about our bias toward bias. Now, our biases strongly influence what we believe and why. Now, I want you to get this statement closely. So I want to say it a couple of times. What we believe to be true is true to us, even if it's not rooted in truth. Let me say that again. What we believe to be true is true to us, even if it's not rooted in truth. And this is where a bias can be problematic because these types of biases can lead to some very unpleasant and some very uncomfortable outcomes for ourselves and for other people. Now, you may realize it by now as I've gotten into this teaching for just a few minutes, and if not, let me give you an aha moment. Many of the biases that you and I cling to and that we hold on to are nothing more than learned behaviors that we were taught early on in our lives. And what is learned can be unlearned. Now, these, these biases that we learned early on in our lives are referred to scientifically as implicit biases. Now, an implicit bias, by definition, is a subconscious feeling, it's an attitude, it's a prejudice, or it's a stereotype. These implicit biases come from prior influences, where early influencers in our lives and later influences who we allowed to have influence over us neurally imprinted their beliefs in our thinking, and we accepted them as true whether they were true or not. And as a result of that, those influences and influencers shaped our decision-making without our conscious thought. But again, it's a learned behavior. And a learned behavior can be unlearned and replaced with a new learned behavior. Let me give you an example. We as a species experience roughly 60,000 thoughts a day. Now, that's a lot of thinking going on between our ears. And if you think about 60,000 thoughts a day and you tried to pay attention to every single one of those, you'd never get anything else done but think about your thinking all day long. So to preserve our thinking power, to make sure we're focusing on what is necessary, what is important, and what is critical to our survival and success, deep within our brain is an area called the reticular activating system. Now, this part of our brain filters what we pay attention to, and it's been programmed to do that. Again, it's a program. What has been programmed can be unprogrammed and reprogrammed to filter in a different way. So what does the reticular activating system do? It gives preference, i.e. bias. It gives a bias, a preference to certain thoughts 
that it's been programmed to elevate into our conscious thinking and it filters out other thoughts that the filtering system says are not essential, not important, not necessary, or go against what we believe. And as a result of that, those thoughts never rise to our conscious awareness. The reticular activating system amplifies certain thoughts to our conscious awareness and others are simply a passing thought. Now, scientists have identified, get this, more than 150 different biases that we as a species have to deal with. And all of these different biases can affect our decision-making in some way. So for the next five hours, I want to go through these 150 biases. No, I'm just kidding. I want to focus on just a handful of common biases just to give you a taste of what you and I go through every day and how these biases influence the way we think, the way we process and prioritize information, the way we view the world around us, the way we view people, and some steps we can take to mitigate the negative influence these biases can have in the way they influence the way we make decisions and take action. Now, the first of these is affinity bias, also referred to as a similarity bias. Now, an affinity bias is when one person or a group of people is favored over every other group of people or every other person because they share similar traits or attributes. It doesn't matter whether they are extremely knowledgeable, extremely experienced, or they have expertise in some area. This bias says we like people because they are like us. Now, think about it. Most of us prefer to be with people who are like us. It is part of the human existence. We want to be part of a tribe. We want to be part of a community. We want to be part of a clique, if I can use that word, being with people that are like ourselves, that share common traits and attributes. But the problem when we do that is this. We begin to segregate people simply by traits and attributes into an in-group or an out-crowd. The in-crowd or the out-crowd. Well, I want to be in the in-group, but I want to be out of the out-group. That is where division takes place. Better yet, how do we mitigate the affinity or similarity bias? We seek to find common ground with everyone. We look beyond simply traits and attributes that we are similar in terms of look or ethnicity or gender or other basic things, and we go deeper. Does that individual have knowledge, experience, expertise, or life skills that they can bring to us that we don't have? When we seek to find common ground, here's what we learn. Anyone and everyone can contribute their talent. And when they do, we gain different perspectives than what we have through our narrow filter view of the world around us. And all of a sudden, opportunities present themselves that have always been there. We've just simply chosen to overlook them because of the filter that we have actually colors those out and we can't see that they're there. Now, the second bias is conformity bias. What is that? Often referred to by another name, peer pressure or groupthink. You know, you've got only to turn on the news today and watch some of these groups on college campuses and some of the other groups that are seeking to shut down free speech here and there and not allowing dissenting views to be shared, and you get an idea of conformity bias. Conformity bias says one person's opinion is not important. It is important that we all think and act the same way. That's conformity bias. When one person's opinion is swayed to align with the consensus of the group, we're utilizing peer pressure or groupthink to get everybody to think and act the same way. Even if what they're thinking and what they're doing as a result of that is incorrect or it's based on incomplete or simply bad information. So how do we overcome conformity bias? We've got to open up the opportunity to hear dissenting views. We've got to open up the opportunity to hear things that we may not agree with, but allows us to understand another person's perspective. Now, why is this important? It's through the sharing of many ideas that good ideas are discovered. And then it's through fleshing out these good ideas through a variety of different lenses with a variety of different people bringing their own thoughts and life experience to the conversation that a good idea can become 
a better idea. And it's through the evaluation and consideration and pondering of better ideas that the best idea is finally identified. When everyone has an opportunity to contribute their thoughts or their ideas to the process, we're going to gain a unique perspective we otherwise wouldn't have. When everybody is forced to think and act the same way, then you're going to do the same things the same way over and over, mindlessly, blindly, oftentimes oblivious to a truth that is out there that you have yet to understand or embrace. And we need to understand this. Despite our dissensions, despite our views that may vary, all of us together are better than any one of us. And here's what I can also tell you about conformity bias. There is your truth and their truth, and somewhere in the middle is the truth. Our goal to overcome conformity bias is to look at our truth, to hear another person's truth, and find the common ground in the middle where we can agree to disagree on certain points, but do so without being disagreeable. Now, the third attribute I want to point out in terms of a bias is attribution bias. Now, this is where we judge an individual based upon the behaviors of a group of people or a small sampling of a group. This can unfairly label a person or a group of people in a negative light. Simply because we see one or two people acting inappropriately, we want to say, well, they all act that way. That is not true of any people group anywhere in the world. Now, how do we overcome this attribution bias? Well, hear me when I say this. We tend to judge other people by their actions, what they do and they don't do. But we tend to judge ourselves by our intent, what we intended to accomplish, whether we actually succeeded or not. So one of the ways we overcome attribution bias is we avoid making assumptions about other people's motivations. We look beyond their actions to see what was the motive behind it and let them share what their intent was in doing what they did. Maybe they saw a different way to try to do something to serve the common good, but it just didn't work out the way they planned. We've got to be willing to extend some grace to people because none of us are perfect. We're all going to have successes. We're all going to experience failure. We're all going to at times stumble and fall. So we've got to be open to extend grace. We've got to maintain open communication and look for opportunities to collaborate, allowing everyone to contribute in their own way and in doing so, demonstrate their value and their worth. Now, the fourth bias, and I want to point out this one and one more, the fourth bias that I want to point out is authority bias. We see this a lot in society today where there is a tendency of a group of people to want to agree with the person who's perceived as having the greatest amount of authority, power, or influence in a group. When this happens, we end up seeing a dictatorship take place where one individual or a small group of individuals are telling everyone else what to do. And when authority bias takes place, it limits creativity, it limits innovation, and it limits the opportunity of the individuals as part of that group to rise to their full potential. So how do we overcome this authority bias? Here's what I can tell you about that. You've got to have good leaders because a good leader understands that those closest to the problem probably have the best understanding of why that problem is taking place and at least have the basics of how we best solve the problem or move the process forward where it can later be refined by other people contributing to that decision to move forward and to fix the problem. So good leaders allow those closest to the problem to fix the problems that they are closest to. A good leader is always going to encourage the open sharing of ideas rather than dictating from the top down. Good leaders are always asking the question, is there a better way that we can do this or that? And to seek input and guidance from the group, because again, all of us are better than any one of us. And to borrow the an acronym from TEAM, together, everyone achieves more. Now, the last bias I want to touch on is the status quo bias, because that's one that we deal with every single day of our lives. It's the tendency of an individual or a group of people to hold on to an established habit, 
established processes, established systems, established behaviors, or established ways of thinking. Remember, the status quo, as I've shared many, many times on this podcast, loves the familiar. It wants to do the same thing over and over, and it resists change. Status quo bias prefers the familiar, and it resists innovation and change at all costs. It sees anything outside of the familiar and the status quo as a potential threat or danger. Now, understand this. You and I are all creatures of habit. But if we do the same thing the same way over and over again, we're going to get the same outcome. Nothing changes until something changes. Did you hear me when I said that? Nothing changes until something changes. You know, I, I say often when I'm doing sales training with uh, a, a number of different industries, if you do the same thing you've always done, you're going to get what you've always got. If you do what other people are doing, you're going to get the same thing other people are getting. But if you do what nobody else is doing, or you do something everybody else is doing better than anyone else, you're going to get noticed. You're going to get ahead in life. That's just true in life. But if we do the same thing the same way over and over again, nothing changes. Now, this is how people and organizations ultimately stagnate and businesses seek to exist. You know, Ray Kroc said it well. He said, as long as you're green, you're growing. But once you're ripe, you start to rot. Carly Fiorina in her book, Find Your Way, I think has a great response to status quo bias. She says this in her book. The status quo has great power, but leaders challenge the status quo to change things for the better. So how do we overcome status quo bias? We challenge the status quo to change things for the better. We choose to get outside of what's familiar and to get into that uncomfortable place where growth happens, where new ideas are experimented and tried, and all of a sudden we discover there's a new or better way to do what we've always done to get a better outcome. Remember, nothing changes until something changes. Now, we all have biases. Every single one of us have a bias. We are, as a species, a biased people. We all have a bias bias. But you got to understand, not all biases are bad. In fact, some of the biases that you and I have as individuals and as a group are beneficial. These biases can serve as mental shortcuts based on past experience that allow us to make better, faster decisions. We refer to these types of biases as preferences for action. Now, these preferences for action serve as a reference point to help us make decision making easier, faster, and more productive. And at times, these can actually save our lives. You know, if a car's coming your way at 50 miles an hour and you're standing in the street, you don't want to have to stop and evaluate. You want to have a bias for action to get out of the way of the car so you don't get run over. That is one of the examples where a bias can actually serve us well. But by the same token, a bias can and often does filter how we view the world around us. And it can cause us to think and act in ways that sometimes serve us well, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes that bias can lead us to see the world around us in a way that we take actions that not only don't serve us well, they don't serve others as well either. And this is where biases can be harmful. Now, this is where reflective thinking can be valuable. So I want to leave you with a few reflective thoughts, and I want to give you 10 questions that I want you to consider as you're thinking about your bias towards bias, the bias bias in your life. Now, even better, as I give you these questions, I'd encourage you to take some time to ponder these questions and journal your responses. And then after you've done that, find someone that knows you well, that you can give carte blanche to speak into your life. Because they're going to see biases and prejudices and preconditions and preferences that you have that are implicit to you and you may not even realize they're there because you've done it so long. It's just part of your subconscious thinking and those things happen in your life automatically. 
We can't unlearn a behavior until we recognize that behavior is there. And that's what this exercise is designed to do. So here are 10 reflective questions that you can use to have an opportunity to challenge yourself and examine your biases. Now, you can start and stop the podcast to write these down, or you can go to my Substack channel. It's Black Belt Leadership on Substack, and you can find this week's newsletter, and those 10 questions are there. If you're a LinkedIn fan, you'll also find it on LinkedIn. Under there, it's under Master Your Life. That's the name of the newsletter in LinkedIn. Black Belt Leadership on Substack, Master Your Life on LinkedIn, or just simply stop and start the podcast you're listening to and get those questions written down. All right, here we go. Number one, what assumptions do you make about people based on their appearance, their background, and their identity? Number two, how do your social, cultural, or personal experiences influence the way you perceive other people? Number three, when you have judged someone for truly getting to know them, what was the impact of that judgment? How did that affect your relationship with that person? Number four, how do you react when someone challenges your views or your beliefs? Do you listen openly or do you become defensive and why? Number five, what voices or what perspectives are missing in the media, your workplace, or your community that you engage with? And how can you seek out those other perspectives and include them in your thinking? Number six, can you recall a time when you discovered you were wrong about a person or a group of people? How did that change your thinking? Number seven, what steps can you take to become more aware of your subconscious biases in your everyday interactions with others? Number eight, how often do you engage in conversations with people who have different backgrounds, opinions, or beliefs? What do you learn from those interactions? Number nine, what practices can you implement to interrupt biased thoughts or behaviors when they arise. And number 10, are you willing to take accountability for the ways your biases might harm other people and what are you willing to do to make amends? Now, as we wrap up, let me leave you with this. We all have a bias towards bias. We are all biased people. When we learn to recognize how our biases are helping or harming us, we can then become more intentional about what we believe and the corresponding actions that follow. You know, perhaps the world would be a much better place to live if we kept our biases and our opinions to ourselves and everybody around us did the same. Perhaps the world around us would be a much better place to live if we simply agreed to disagree without being disagreeable? What if we taught to see another person's perspective just to understand how it differs from our own? Perhaps the world around us would be a much better place to live if we focused more on meeting the needs of those around us, seeing each and every person as valuable and treating them accordingly. Perhaps that starts with you today. I'm Dr. John Terry, the Black Belt Leader. Thanks for joining me. Have a great day.